I'm Richard Hara, and this is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. I'm pleased to welcome to the program today two members of our faculty, Samantha Winter and Courtney Cogburn. Samantha and Courtney, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to be here, thanks. Our topic today is COVID-19 and environmental justice. And I was watching TV the other day and saw something. They were talking about, I guess, the unexpected silver lining um, for this pandemic is that because of social distancing and the lockdown of cities and, and generally the, the um, shutdown of, of, of the global economy that people aren't driving, um, you know, plants are shutting down, things like that. And the, the terrible, I mean, human cost of that aside, um, it's really cut down on pop, uh, pollution, uh, air pollution and so on. The, people are able to sort of see the uh, mountains from, from cities for the first time in, in, in literally decades. Um, you know, you've got uh, um, wild animals in the streets of some major cities and so on. And while that all sounds well and good, and, and, and certainly we need to think about um, the, the environment, I think, you know, this, well, I don't know, maybe I can ask you, is this an inflection point or is this raising consciousness about the environment, um, you know, uh, for people in a way that maybe we can sort of think more productively about uh, um, climate change and, and environmental justice moving forward? I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Um, yeah. Sure, I'll jump in here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a unique moment, and I certainly hope it's a moment that we take advantage of. I think that, you know, climate scientists are, you know, really excited about this moment in time because they're able to test things that they haven't been able to test in a long time because you can sort of hardly ever expect to set up an experiment where you have less air pollution all at once um, in a variety of contexts around the world. And so I think they're really excited about this moment to kind of study um, some of the different aspects of climate change that we haven't been able to study yet. So I think that's great. Um, and I also think, you know, being able to see, <clears throat> excuse me, mountains from a city that you haven't been able to see can be a huge motivator for citizens to kind of um, want more of this, want cleaner air and kind of push for climate change adjustment. But I think it's, it's dangerous to say that this is a panacea. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot, you know, I think Courtney and I will talk a lot about sort of the environmental justice and the inequalities of how climate change are experienced. And some of that is definitely not going away, especially um, in the COVID-19 pandemic. And I also think the policy um, in the United States and around the world has not necessarily reflected a great change in this climate change moment. So, you know, in the United States alone in, in March, um, the, the Trump administration and the EPA suspended enforcement of U.S. environmental laws um, amid COVID-19. So if you can kind of cite COVID-19 as a reason why um, you aren't able to kind of meet the, the standards um, from say refineries or a, or a power plant, then, then you have kind of a, an excuse or an adjustment for that right now. And so I think it's, we have to, we have to be clear that that is having impacts on communities, you know, in an unequally distributed way. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And just sort of thinking about the, the current moment, but what happens afterwards, right? When things do settle down and, uh, and you know, people have an opportunity to go back to their jobs, to their regular lives, and so on. I, you know, I'm I'm almost afraid of a sort of rebound kind of um, phenomenon where you know people sort of go back to their old bad habits with a vengeance. So um, I wonder if if that's something that we also need to be um, concerned about. So um, and and you know, I'm gonna ask you, uh, Samantha, to talk a little bit more about your specific uh, background and research interests in terms of um, how the environment affects or 
contributes to inequities in um, health care and access to um, health care, but um, also just sort of to take it to a, a more uh, a sort of broader policy level, I wanted to turn to Courtney now and, and sort of ask you, Courtney, about your involvement. Um, I understand that uh, Columbia University has formed a uh, climate change task force and that you're a participant in this group. And um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, what this uh, venture uh, aims to do and, and a little bit of background to it? Yeah, so the, the climate change task force uh, was convened uh, by President Bollinger and Alex Halliday um, uh, was leading this group uh, who directs the Earth Institute. And it brought together faculty from across disciplines and the university to think carefully about what is the role of Columbia uh, specifically and what is the role of the university more broadly in dealing with issues of climate change and, and climate justice. And in addition to climate scientists, people who um, study various aspects of the climate, um, you had artists and uh, the dean of the business school and, and people from all over campus thinking very carefully about this from multiple disciplinary perspectives. Um, our role was to think about the, the various ways that we thought Columbia could have a positive um, and meaningful impact in this space and to prepare a report for the president. Um, and uh, now I think we're in the phase of deciding on next steps in terms of how do we translate the recommendations of the task force um, uh, in terms of something more concrete in terms of what the university is going to do. That, that sounds wonderful. I'm, I'm just wondering uh, who is on the task force? Um, is it multidisciplinary? Um, what does that look like? It is. Uh, you know, the Dean of the School of Architecture, uh, School of Business, the uh, um, Mind Brain Behavior Institute, uh, representatives from uh, public health, social work, the law school, uh, it really uh, cut across pretty broadly in terms of uh, disciplinary perspective. Some of those people had substantive experience in research and expertise related to climate. Um, other, others of us, myself included, didn't previously have any background um, in terms of our professional lives associated with climate. But the idea was um, what sorts of points of view might people who think about justice more broadly, social justice, uh, social inequalities, how do those perspectives come to bear on how we're thinking about, um, uh, you know, the, the existential crisis um, mm. for us. Um, and I think to Sam's earlier point, the, the idea of cleaner air, less pollution happening right now, I think is important, not in terms of it's going to turn around the long-term effects that we've sort of set up, but if we leverage it, it might be important for helping people understand the possibilities of how we can alter our behaviors and what the outcomes can be in a very tangible way. I think like you were suggesting, Sam, that might actually shift our understanding and understanding policy. But I think it requires leveraging this moment very strategically to, to have that translate for the, for the general public. Um, yeah. No, uh, and uh, sort of, again, looking at the current moment and, and, and what we need to do to plan for the future, but also sort of drawing upon past research, right? And, and uh, what do we know about um, uh, how inequities do uh, come about as a result of certain environmental um, stressors and, and so on. So I wanna to get to that point in just a second, but I do want to remind our viewers that we do reserve the last 10 minutes of the program for Q&A. So if you have a question, please submit it via the chat box um, on Facebook Live, and we'll try to bring them in um, possibly uh, earlier rather than later as we're able to in the conversation. Um, also, uh, let's see, um, we can, well, let me let me just bring it back then to um, Samantha. So I, I I just pulled the the definition. Environmental justice occurs when all people equally experience high levels of environmental protection, and no group or community is excluded from the environmental policy decision making process, nor is affected by a disproportionate impact 
from environmental hazards. Um, this is from the Council on Social Work Education and, and, and how we're trying to sort of bring the whole idea of environmental justice into our curriculum and, and into our practice uh, more broadly. But, you know, this sounds very aspirational. What's your experience been in sort of looking at um, environmental justice issues very concretely, practically um, in your work? Yeah, I mean, so I, I focus on kind of three areas in terms of um, the inequalities of not just who has access to sort of environmental resources, but also, um, you know, who is most affected by air pollution, for example. So I focus on water and sanitation pretty heavily, um, and then air quality as well. Um, so I work predominantly in informal settlements um, in East Africa, um, but there's a lot of correlations between you know, I guess there's a lot of inequalities around the world. It's not just isolated to the communities that I work in. It's also prevalent in the United States. Um, but essentially, we're, we're looking at some pretty extreme inequalities. For example, 2.2 billion people lack access to basic toilets or basic sanitation. About 785 million people lack access to water around the world. Um, in terms of COVID, about you know, 3 billion people lack access to soap and water in combination for sort of hand hygiene. And so in terms of looking at the, this, this COVID um, response, all of these things come to play, right? So, you know, lacking access to water, lacking access to sanitation, lacking access to sort of hygienic opportunities means that it's harder to prevent the spread of the illness in these communities. Um, you know, it's harder to sort of access um, resources in a way that allows for social distancing. For example, if you share a toilet with 20 families or, or 100 families, the ability to, to social distance becomes very difficult. Um, and and this, this comes to play, I think, in the United States as well. We don't talk about it that much, but with homeless communities, many of them rely on public toilets and facilities um, for sort of hygiene and everyday experiences and not having access to those means that, you know, they either aren't able to social distance or, or they aren't able to take care of their needs in certain ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in terms of air quality, you know, there's a lot of conversation about this in the United States and around the world. Folks who live in proximity or are most affected by poor air quality tend to be you know, our, our Black and Latinx communities in the United States um, and in some of the communities that I work in, some of the most impoverished communities, right? And so, you know, there's a differential aspect to that, but there are higher rates of asthma, higher rates of respiratory diseases, um, or respiratory infections, I guess, um, chronic pulmonary obstructive um, disease and um, sort of lung disease, lung cancer, all of these things that have to do with air quality and, and long-term exposure to, to sort of pollutants in the air. Um, and they're not, they're just not experienced equally. And so when we, when we talk about, you know, who is at higher risk or is more vulnerable to COVID-19, um, you know, we think about these communities, these, these um, you know, and our indigenous communities, our black and brown communities, um, they're the ones that are experiencing these kind of higher rates of hospitalizations or deaths. Um, because of COVID-19. And I don't think we can separate that from access to resources and, and air pollution and, and sort of our environmental justice pillars. And yeah. I think it's important to, to name, you know, in that, that conversation, right, it's not just that Black, Brown, and Indigenous people, you weren't saying this, Sam, but to make it explicit, it's not that Black, Brown, and Indigenous people happen to live in places with poor air quality. Decisions were made about where to put oil refineries. Decisions were made about where to dump trash that contribute to these factors. Um, so that falls under the umbrella of structural racism, right? So when you're trying to connect environmental justice and structural racism and COVID-19 and who's more vulnerable, all of these things are tied together and we can't separate them out as if some groups just happen to be at greater risk for the effects of COVID-19, for instance. It's, it's really all tied together. And it's, and it's a phenomenon that's occurring not just um, here in the United States, but also in East Africa, in, in, in South Asia, uh, and so on, where the uh, most vulnerable populations, right, are, are subject to uh, the, the, the greatest harm. Um, we have a question, Dr. Cogburn. It's, it's, it's um, from one of our viewers. Your work 
on the physiological effects of racism on black bodies' lives has been profound for the way we think about racism. This has been on my mind a lot, seeing how COVID-19 has had so much higher rates of mortality in the black community. In Mississippi, 117 black deaths, 65 white deaths, um, one other death to date, nearly a two to one ratio. So um, again, sort of speaking to the point that you were just making um, and more generally um, uh, in terms of, you know, what, what, how do we sort of reconcile, um, you know, the social component of this to, to what I think for a lot of people it seems to be, you know, a more natural kind of thing, right? It's a pandemic. Um, you know, viruses are part of the natural environment and, you know, we just, we, we're just, you know, dealing with it as best that we can. Yeah, I think, you know, we could have, we could have a whole episode on, on just this. I think my short answer is let's not be surprised by the pattern that we're observing. Um, I think the degree of the difference that we're, that we're seeing is pretty astounding, but the general pattern that black and brown people are worse off from the effects of COVID should not be surprising given the points that Samantha just made, given the patterns that we have for, for health inequities more broadly. And more importantly, let's think about why those things are happening. And when we start to see popu population level patterns by racial groups, it's not individual choice that's contributing to that pattern that we're observing. There's something mm -hmm. else at play. It's probably something structural. It's probably something related to policy, which means policy and structural level solutions are going to be what's needed to solve those issues. It's not going to be, you know, black people get it together and stop hanging out and playing basketball and care about your abuela and your big mama, like the Surgeon General said in his comments. Um, it's not a matter of individual choice at that point. When you see an entire group of people being so disproportionately impacted, we have to start looking for other factors and grapple with who we are as a country about whether we're going to do something about that or continue sort of accepting that some people are just at greater risk than others. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think the the early uh, media coverage, right, of sort of looking at the higher rates of uh, black and brown people, um, you know, suffering from COVID nineteen, um, so pointed to uh, various sort of internet kind of things, um, beliefs that uh, um, black people uh, were immune to COVID nineteen in the beginning, and so on, and and again, sort of framing it as a, a kind of individual choice rather than a sort of a systemic phenomenon and so on. So um, I have another question here, um, and I don't know um, if you, Courtney, or Samantha would like to address it, but could you discuss the inequities that Native Americans face environmentally? Um, Samantha, I think you were uh, maybe mentioning that earlier. Yeah, I mean, so that's that's definitely something we're seeing now. So um, certainly with a lot of the media coverage that's coming out of the Navajo Nation, um, which is sort of the largest reservation um, in the United States, again, going back to some of these inequities to access. So one of the things that has kind of come about um, is that Native Americans are sort of 19 times um, more likely to lack access to indoor plumbing than the, the average white American. Um, and so, you know, that says a lot, again, in terms of sort of the spread of the disease. So being able to prevent it through washing your hands or through hygiene, but also in terms of sort of stress and the added compounded stress of having to, to navigate that situation, right? Having to access water from offsite, perhaps, you know, perhaps that's compounded with not having access to electricity or access to um, food resources in the same way. And so I think that, you know, paying attention to how many layers there are to this. So, you know, there's sort of an, 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 an environmental inequality in some ways in terms of being able to access resources in the same way, but that's compounded by a lack of access to healthcare or, you know, a lack of access to, um, or food insecurity or a lack of access to um, sort of other resources, electricity that can kind of help mitigate the situation, help people, you know, to social distance and stay at home. Um, I think that it's just, that is, that is one of the things is it's the COVID-19 is, as Courtney is talking about, is exacerbating these inequalities that we, that already exist, right? And so, you know, paying attention to the fact that these are systemic issues that, and they are, they are many. Right. And so, you know, when we're talking about, you know, the access to to these resources in Native American communities, 
it's, as Courtney said, not a surprise that they are dealing with higher rates of infection, of a spread, of deaths, um, because of these kinds of lack of resources to begin with. So, um, so I wanted to just raise this question because we've focused on perhaps race um, and, and to a certain extent ethnicity as a determining factor, but uh, um, your work, Samantha, has, has focused more on uh, women, right, and, and sort of uh, uh, gender, I guess, and, and how environmental inequities specifically affect women and, and make them more vulnerable. Um, so I, can you sort of speak to that issue a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, I mean, I think that <laughs> there's a lot of gender disparities in terms of um, gender roles, and a lot of that has to do centers around some of these environmental aspects, right? So women um, in the communities that I work in tend to be the ones that are in charge of cooking. Um, they're in charge of collecting water. Um, they're sort of in charge of uh, teaching and training children about hygiene and sanitation, um, making sure that you know they manage the sanitation needs of their children. And so they, when, it, when we talk about lack of resources or when we talk about who's exposed to higher um, levels of air pollution, for example, indoors, when you're cooking with charcoal or you're cooking with firewood, um, it means that there's a lot of disparities in the way that you experience certain aspects and certain, I, I think that's probably true of COVID-19, although I think we don't know exactly, um, but women have, you know, higher rates of, of, um, of these indoor exposure to, from cooking and, and, and the stress of having to go collect water and make sure that there's enough water for the entire family and meeting those needs. Um, and then, you know, in terms of sanitation. So I think when there re when there's a lack of these resources, it means that women are really kind of facing a level of psychological stress um, that we haven't paid that much attention to. So more and more, we're starting to look at this and we're starting to understand that these kind of in inequities in access to resources are really having kind of um, huge uh, mental and psychological effects for women. Um, and so that's kind of what I look at is this, this um, women have kind of an added layer that they have to, that they have to deal with when they're, when they're in these environments. Yeah, so, so moving from the global south back to here in North America, Courtney, um, I mean, are we looking at sort of women specifically within communities of color and how that's affecting their, you know, access to health care and, and, and perpetuating and exacerbating existing health care inequities? We, we certainly do, right? Mm -hmm. And we observe some, some meaningful differences uh, at, those, at those intersections. Um, and just to take a step back, I think it's important for us to shift our, our framing and language around this, that it's not race or gender that's hmm. causing the problem. It's racism and sexism and cultural norms, right, that are causing these problems that affect people who are in those different categories. And so, um, again, that kind of framing is really important because it removes the culpability for the issue from the body that's being oppressed and under threat to the social issue that's putting their body under threat. That kind of framing is, is really important. Um, yeah. But certainly in, in health research, people think about various intersections by race and gender and in other categories and positionalities and the ways in which they might affect um, patterns um, in terms of what we're observing uh, with health and health inequality. Um, and, we, and we do observe, we don't quite know what's happening with COVID-19 just yet, that data mm -hmm. um, it's still being released and you know I certainly have some concerns about the quality of the data that we'll actually get so where will we collecting demographic information where are we collecting it consistently and will we really be able to break down the nuance of these different issues um, because without going into detail we certainly see difference by race and gender within racial ethnic minority groups that are meaningful for us to understand and I hope we will be able to understand that um, with with COVID-19 as well but that's to be determined yeah I, I, I think it, the uh, task force said that they were going to get some some of that data uh, within a few days, but then uh, now it's going to take probably at least a month before they, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare uh, can, can um, pull those uh, numbers um, according to uh, racial demographics. So, so we'll we'll see. Hopefully, we'll we'll have an opportunity to to make sense of uh, that information in a productive way. So, um, speaking of a productive way, I, I want to sort of bring it back um, there um, 
uh, to questions here from the audience. Uh, one is there has been a lot of discussion on wildlife markets and poor living conditions for the spread of COVID-19. How can we address that from the perspective of supporting low income areas to ensure that another outbreak does not happen, um, but those individuals are still able to make a living? So um, Samantha or Courtney, uh, who would like to <laughs> field this one? I think my, my, my general reaction is, is not about wildlife markets in particular, mm -hmm. but it does relate to the politics of social distancing and the politics of public health. Um, mm -hmm. Too often when we make broad public health recommendations, we're not considering the circumstances of different communities and their ability to adhere to these sort of generic public health norms that are being um, uh, subscribed. Um, and the same applies for cultural practices, norms, ways in which families are constructed, ways in which communities are constructed, the ways in which households are formed, uh, the ways in which we eat food and um, you know, commune with each other. All of those things come into play in terms of whether we are, are able to adhere to generic public health norms. And I think there are probably, um, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I imagine that there's probably a spectrum of those norms that might work and might keep us more or less safe. And if we started to um, think about the various circumstances that, in which people live and start to think about a broader range of what's safe and what's healthier, um, mm. while not sort of um, denying cultural norms and practices, the ways, again, ways in which families are constructed might help to keep more people safe. But if we only prescribe you know, this much distance, these are the rules, this is what you do, and then you're not able to adhere to that, then you might just throw it all out of the window and not do any of it. Um, mm. So I think my, my short answer is, can we think about a broader spectrum of public health regulations that help keep people on the safer end of the spectrum while not completely denying the ways in which they construct and live their lives? Mm -hmm. um, Samantha, did you want to follow up to that? Yeah, I might add to that a bit. I mean, I also think that this, this ties in, if I understand the question correctly, this ties into sort of people's livelihoods and access to the informal market. So, so many of the folks around the world, including in this country more and more, um, are reliant on informal sector work, right? And so, you know, that is somebody's entire bread and butter. Um, and so to think about, you know, adding extra regulations or restrictions into these communities means that these people have less and less access to sort of their, their sustainability as a family or as an individual. Um, and I think that's a dangerous way to think about regulations as Courtney's talking about. I think you need to pay more attention to, you know, centering people who are in the informal sector so that they have, a, you know, a broader access to market or, 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 re or putting in regulations that don't um, create more challenges for them. And we've seen sort of the opposite happening among the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where a lot of the regulations and choices cut off families from the informal market altogether through social distancing. So those of us who are more privileged who have access to being able to work at home um, or to communicating uh, via the internet, we are weathering this storm a lot better than those folks who are reliant on the informal market, who you know rely on being able to sell their goods on a daily basis. And sometimes that's living day to day um, or living week to week and, and making sure that the, the survival of the family is upheld. And so I think it's really dangerous to kind of target these kind of informal sector workers as like, the, the, the reason for the spread of certain diseases or the cause of the, of the spread of certain diseases. I think that's a, that's a really dangerous um, kind of way to look at it. And I think we need to think about alternatives. But uh, we're not, I mean, we're not framing this in terms of, you know, a, 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 the good of the community and public health on the one hand versus the good of the economy, the health of the economy on the other, right? I mean, it's, it's not dichotomous and, and, and I think, you know, how, how do we sort of sort out these systemic, systemic issues in a way that embraces and holds both truths, right? That we, we do want to make sure that uh, um, we're protecting the public health, but at the same time, um, you know, we can't just take away uh, a means of livelihood to people um, based on, on these general prescriptions. So, so how, how 
you know, how do we address these as issues as social workers? What's, what's the path forward um, in your opinion? I mean, I think that's part of, you know, part of where we started in terms of thinking about the task force and having all those different perspectives at the table, mm -hmm. trying to solve the same problem. It, it, it applies to COVID-19 and other issues as well. And I think social work is such a critical piece to this conversation. We're more likely to center people and communities and think about the most vulnerable, the most oppressed people in our country and in our communities and think about their needs and not that there's just sort of a easy solution um, to, to solve these issues, but those perspectives and centering vulnerable communities becomes incredibly important to not doing increasing damage to people who have already been, you know, incredibly harmed by our policies and, and decisions. So I think, you know, social work is an important piece of that. Sam, what, what do you think in terms of the purpose we serve? <laughs> I mean, I think social work is is an essential um, part of this conversation and, and on many different levels, right? So social workers are unique in that they are pushing for policy changes. They're also involved in sort of the frontline work. You know, they're in hospitals. They're working with um, organizations who are providing food to people who can't access food. They're providing, um, you know, resources to communities. So they're kind of frontline workers. At the same time, they're pushing policies. At the same time, they're also doing advocacy work, right? So, you know, really trying to center some of these conversations that are often left out when we have to take drastic action to prevent something like at the spread of a pandemic, right? So they're the ones that are kind of trying to voice, um, to center the conversation around voices that, that may not be able to have the same access to, to resources that others do. Um, and so I think social workers are absolutely essential in this conversation. Um, before I, I moved into social work, I was in engineering and I moved into social work because I felt like there needed to be this conversation about how uh, you know technology, about how policy affects human beings and communities and also how communities need to be involved in the decisions around each one of those things. Um, so I mean, I think they're essential. <laughs> And there's an interesting contrast when we're when we're in an emergency in a pandemic like this that it helps to reveal so starkly the inequalities in our country in environment and economics and health etc but it also kind of can lead us to make these decisions these quick decisions that are about let's save lives and we're not considering who the most vulnerable people are we're not making decisions that might help save their lives as well we may write them off as being at greatest risk and they're less likely to live. So let's focus on the people who are more likely to live, who happen to be richer, whiter, et cetera. We can't wait for a pandemic, pandemic to end to start thinking about restorative justice, to start thinking about equity. Um, and I think social work is an important voice in, in helping us to, to not wait too late to, to avoid the damage of, of um, the decisions we might make during a pandemic. Yeah, well, thank you, Courtney, for that reminder and also a call to arms for us as a profession and as a discipline. Um, I'd like to thank you both um, for joining us today on Social Impact Live. It was really wonderful to have you um, to sort of provide um, um, sort of different perspectives on this issue of environmental justice and what we can do um, to move that agenda forward. So again, uh, Courtney and Samantha, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, and thank you all um, for tuning in to our program today. Um, our next program on Thursday will be a panel discussion um, with frontline responders to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you and take care. Bye-bye now. <laughs>